Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Henry Thomas Buckle once said, Welcome to The Advocate, where thought-provoking topics are discussed with no hold back here on Plus TV Africa. We basically call it Spade by its name. I'll be talking about the creative industry and how it is fast becoming an endangered space that we must ultimately protect. If Edo Lakpo's myth is with a little or no representation of women in the tech world. Peter is talking about how to engage millennials and Gen Z in the same workplace. And finally, Tonya is pointing out a rising crisis in the educational system, which is the school fees. Sit back, and after this break, we'll be here to dissect it all. Stay with us. The creative industry, an endangered idea. Creativity in itself has a broad range of meanings and across sectors. The creative industry will cover sectors such as communications, media, advertising, finance, technology, fintech, entertainment, real estate, fashion, engineering, academia, security. I mean, you get the point, right? Every industry has some measure of creativity embedded, inherent or inherent in it. As a result of this, the industry in itself should be safely protected and encouraged to thrive, grow, and succeed. Because the death of the creative industry is the death of many other sectors that directly impact the economy, and in fact, the GDP of any nation. So I'm interested statistics will help you put this in context. Right, in the United Kingdom, Center for Economic and Business Research, CEBR, reported that the creative industry realized 25.2 billion in direct turnover, 170,250 jobs, and 7.1 billion pounds in employee compensation. Generally, the industry realized 48 billion pounds in turnover, 23 billion pounds in GVA, that's a gross value add, 363,713 jobs, and 13.4 billion pounds in employee compensation alone. In Singapore, the whole country has been impacted by the digital revolution and has the highest mobile penetration rates in the world, and also the most active consumers of online video. The creative industry in Singapore amounted to $23.9 billion in direct contribution to the GDP, an additional $12 billion in indirect contribution, and $12.7 billion in value added, which is total of 5.9% of the GDP of the nation. This cluster, comprising more than 4,500 companies in China, According to the NBS, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics in China, you know, added that China's creative industries increased from 1.052 trillion in 2010 to 2.735 trillion in 2015, representing an expanded share in GDP from 2.75% to 3.82%. In terms of growth rates, the China's creative sector you know, achieved 11% in 2015 higher than the macroeconomic level. The cultural and creative industries have thus become a main impetus for promoting China's economic growth and optimizing its structure. In South Africa, it was found that the core creative industries contributed 3.5% to the South African GDP in 2017. That is 155 billion rands, you know, which is a total share of 5.29% of the GDP. The creative industries contributed 2.53% to the gross value add of South Africa, which is 1.56 billion rands. In Nigeria, a new report shows Nigeria's creative industry is the country's large, second largest employer of labor and has the potential to produce 2.7 million jobs by 2025. The study by Jobber Ramam also finds that the creative industry employs 4.2 million people across five sectors, media, entertainment, beauty, and lifestyle, visual arts, as well as tourism and hospitality. The creative industry in Nigeria is said to be worth an estimated 2.270 billion naira. It is also worthy of note that the creative industry in Nigeria is largely driven by the youth population, who account for almost half of the whole population. The question then begs itself, why isn't there an enabling environment for the youth to thrive in Nigeria? The several reports of this population being harvested to other countries due to the hostile environment in Nigeria 
how do we then protest? How do we then protect these endangered species? We must indeed start to get creative ways to protect our young, creative minds. That was a mouthful. I know, right? <laughs> but, you know. I'm a creative industries person. Mm -hmm. I'm in it. I'm a content, like, create content. I produce content. That's what I've been doing for the past 15 years in Nigeria. <laughs> so I understand. Now, it's not set up for, unfortunately, for producers or uh, content creators, creators really to succeed. It just isn't. It's set up for um, those with the infrastructure to succeed. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at, okay, you have this creative idea, right? You want to get it out, you put it out. And creators, we have so much passion. Um, but there's a disconnect between those who are creating the passion mm -hmm. and those who can help get it out there and fund. And when it comes down to it, it's money. And whether any value is actually seen in funding these creative um, you know, projects. And other countries are seeing the value, which is mm -hmm. why we're seeing uh, uh, just an enormous drain of our youth mm -hmm. who are creatives, who are passionate, and who have those skills already. You know, a lot of uh, creative companies are investing in training mm -hmm. and then employ those um, kids they train but then months, just a few months later, they're poached by Canada, they're poached mm -hmm. by the US. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, those who are the gatekeepers here are not willing to do what is necessary in order that we can succeed internally. They're just busy looking at, in the way it is with so many things, just lining their pockets. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, there isn't that value. When you look at how our industry is even set up, it's set up to fail. If we, if we don't even look at the new stuff, right, and we go back and the fact that we still need traditional media here because a lot of people don't have access to data, mm -hmm. they don't have access to the internet or devices, and they're still getting um, consuming through traditional means, radio and television, right? In other countries, you create content, you, you pitch for people mm -hmm. to license your content, they pay you yeah. a valuable sum, yes. mm -hmm. they pay you a valuable sum for that content. Mm -hmm. Here, you pay them to put your content on air. Yeah. It's just set up to fail from the beginning, and it's really, really unfortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. It is, you know, um, you know, just listening to you, and you know, when Tolu talked about, yeah, there's a massive, and unfortunately, you know, it's easy to know when medical doctors are leaving the country. It's easy to know when nurses are leaving, but we don't know how many, how much of our economy has been depleted by creative people who can just. See, I'm not even, let me even start from the basic. You know when um, Governor Babio was in power, he did some things that made almost like, make it look like um, uh, Kwaibon was going to be the destination for movie producers, mm -hmm. um, whilst, um, um, I've Calabar. forgotten the Calabar, mm -hmm. the governor that was there at yeah. the time, built Tinapa, which was all attracted the likes mm -hmm. of, um, um, what is it, um, Ebony, Ebony Light TV, to go there. Mm -hmm. But then you now find out that that place became a money gulper. It's almost like it doesn't pay, because the process of you getting there, they didn't make it easy. They, yeah. It was like, you build a very fantastic facility and put a very high mm. wall. There are no gates. There are mm -hmm. walls. Mm. And so let's, let's leave all of that. All of that are in the past. I think the first thing is um, our leaders, politicians need to, maybe oil should actually dry in Nigeria mm -hmm. to get us to start thinking. Mm -hmm. Politicians, Absolutely. everything we are saying, they, they just amount to grammar because mm -hmm. those guys in Abuja are waiting for, you know, um, the sharing formula. Let's <laughs> generate the money and share it. They are not looking at the money that could come from all these yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Make it easy for this guy to use his phone mm -hmm. and get cheap data. Yeah. Yeah. And Make it easy so for him to charge his phone. It's, it's not as hard as you think, you know, so because mm -hmm. it, like, like, just like Tonya said, so it's like a continuum. You see, on one side of it, there's a creative. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's passionate about what he does. Yeah. He's an artist. On the other side of it is a capitalist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone that can make money, mm -hmm. money out of what of they're him. passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Create the bridge mm -hmm. between the artists mm -hmm. and the capitalists such that I can just do what I love to do. I can thrive at what I love to do. Mm -hmm. Then you've created an enabling environment for that to be valuable to me and to the economy. 
Because it's two things. I mean, I would have created value. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. But at the same time, I'm also adding to the GDP. I mean, look at all these countries. Look at how much the creative industry adds to their mm -hmm. GDP because they've created an environment mm -hmm. that allows creativity not just to thrive, but also to be valuable financially. Yeah. You know? You know, I've... Yeah. Do, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the creative industry is very similar to, to the tech industry mm. where um, you have people that are putting in their hard work, that are doing the same thing that the, their counterparts abroad are doing, but they're not getting the result mm. over here. So it's like, I'm working so hard, but there's nothing. So it's like a case of a prophet is never respected in his mm -hmm. own. Yeah. And now they are seeing it that, like, oh, I can go to... Dubai and then I'll be paid better than this yes. place, I'll be treated better, I can go to the US, to the UK, so there's no need. I mean, take for example, um, KOB2, King of, King of Boys 2, yeah. Kemi released it on Netflix because she knows she'll be able to get her money back. Mm, yeah. awesome. hmm. And Netflix is not owned by Africans, mm -hmm. it's not owned by Nigerians, mm -hmm. it's international. So, yeah. And they've created that platform where Nigerian producers can now say, okay, when, if I create my movie to this standard, I, to to I can put it on this platform yeah. and I can get my money back. Yeah. And I feel like we need more of that. We, um, the artists, the musicians, the people like that, where there's a platform that they can trust and they can get their money back. But again, this money is being ex um, exported, is, is going back yeah. to the US. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. here. Because like, they the, Yeah, yeah. the if government... about it, I did research. I did small research. I mean, Google is... Try it on your Google. Mm -hmm. I just Googled content industry worth in the US. And you see the media and entertainment industry in the US is worth almost $1 trillion. It's mad. It's just the content industry. It's people mad. that provide content. Mm. So, Toya, you're up to... You know, trust me, you're onto something. You know, we just need to it's make just sure... You we know, have yeah. to kind of wake people up. I'm vigorously trying to shake people and mm -hmm. say, look, what are you waiting for? You know, what are you looking for? Every day there's, there's new youth coming mm -hmm. and the ones that we have now also are doing great things. Mm -hmm. And even, I also say, it's not limited to, to youth. Mm -hmm. I always say my, my, on our platform, the youngest producer is four years old. The mm -hmm. oldest yeah. one is 66. Wow. So it's not only a youth thing. There's people who have ideas, people who are creative, people who are dreamers, people who have talent mm -hmm. that can actually create things that the massive population that we have want to see. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that we just have these rigid gatekeepers mm -hmm. who are just focused on certain areas, mm -hmm. but also we're limited in terms of investment opportunities because our system is set up backwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So can I ask a question? Very, more like a playing the devil's advocate. So I would ask, so Tonya, would you rather advise these kids to just keep hoping on hope or hoping against hope? As someday the gatekeepers, because Nigerian gatekeepers don't die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They succeed mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So, do you see that the, any change happening in the next 15, 20 years? Because if this continues this way, would you rather that this um, talents mm. just die off or they should export what they have to where they are going to be compensated? I'm just asking. I think that's a really good question. I think it's multilateral. Mm. I think that there's always just the way our general society, not even this industry is set up, there's always going to be these gatekeepers or haterators, right? So I would say, number one, to anybody who has a dream or is doing this already, you have to try your best to keep going mm -hmm. because our culture, our society depends on the storytellers. Mm -hmm. We're just using different technology to do it. Storytellers are key. You know, history is key. Mm -hmm. Our voice is key. We don't want Oibo people telling our story. Absolutely. Let's encourage us to tell the story, which means there's a certain amount of skill share that needs to happen, mm -hmm. of democratization mm -hmm. that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, I said, it's a global world. It's global. We need to be looking about here and in Africa and the wider international community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would never say limit yourself to just here. No, be looking. Mm -hmm. Whatever technology is available to you, yeah. get yeah. that technology if you can. Great. Don't yeah. be just looking here. You have to be working the traditional and you have to be working the modern. Yeah. And you just have to try your best. It's a hard game, yeah. but I'm still in it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that if you do it consistently enough, and you get get you keep getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a time when the music industry in Nigeria was exactly. wasn't that good. I mean, now mm -hmm. it's the best. It's one mm -hmm. of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. It will stand side mm -hmm. by side with any other music industry mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, Nollywood. 
Yeah. That's not when Hollywood was, yeah. you know, yeah. suffering. But I mean, consistency. But obviously, like you said, there's a bit of also the governmental support mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that got them to where they were, to where they are now. But you know, it was also, you've seen over the years, mm -hmm. they just keep, I mean, keeping, keeping at it, you know, mm -hmm. getting better. Yeah. And then, you know, um, I feel, I personally feel there should be a ministry for, for just creative. set up just mm -hmm. for that. Oh, it doesn't I mean it's big. It. It's a big enough. There's a ministry of creativity. I, I think we, we have it, but they're not doing anything <laughs> as most of the <laughs> ministries. No, because, no, because, okay, let's talk about that. Actually, that's, that's, that's a good point. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. So CBN has the CIFI, CIFI loan, Creators Industry mm -hmm. Loan, and so mm -hmm. does BOI. So they are thinking about these things. They yes. are thinking about, okay, there's this industry. Nollywood has been here, has shown the way. Mm -hmm. But again, the Niger factor kicks in. Yeah. It doesn't reach the people it's meant to be funded. Mm -hmm. Funded, And unfortunately, or it takes too long, or mm -hmm. there's just, you have to put up collateral. All these things that kind of, the barrier is very, very high to, yeah. to entry. But we remain hopeful. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Up, I mean, that was quite interesting. Up next mm -hmm. is Ifedolakwa. Please stay with us. Tech entrepreneurship in Nigeria. Why do we have less women in tech roles? We've seen the rise of tech entrepreneurship in Nigeria since the advent of the popular e-commerce giant that have opened so many opportunities and set a lot of eyes in the Nigerian tech sector. We've had the ride alien startups come up and we see how very quickly they were embraced. We also have um, the mobile money and the payment startups that were just recently bought over by a bigger company abroad for over $200 million, which again has exposed people to the massive opportunities of tech businesses in Nigeria. We have tech companies sponsoring some of Africa's biggest reality shows. But out of all these great startups I've just mentioned, one should wonder how many were or are led by women. Hmm. Well, my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Today there's also science. Like, ah. <laughs> to be honest with you, the question, I mean, while well, that's a valid question, why are there less women in tech? Mm. But again, why are there less women everywhere? If you mm. actually think about it. Mm. Apart from maybe the Ministry of Women Affairs, you know, and maybe if, Fashion, fashion and beauty, in which case a lot of men, a lot of men have even, you know, sort of taken. Mm -hmm. There are less women, you know, seems like women are just, you know, marginalized everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally feel that one of the challenges is early education mm -hmm. and early orientation. Yeah. I feel like our educational system is mm -hmm. sort of, you know, tilted in a certain way that doesn't allow the girl child mm -hmm. to be able to do anything that the, you know, boy child can do. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole conversation that we can get on. Mm -hmm. You see, um, the things where, you know, I have two daughters, I have two girls, and the things where they try to do and they expect me to say, oh, you maybe you can't do because you're a boy. No, you can absolutely do it. You can do it better than him. Go, I mean, go for it. Mm -hmm. I think that that early education, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, from parents, from teachers, from, like you say, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. I think everybody needs to start to encourage the girl child because that's where it starts, mm -hmm. you know, so that they can actually go. I mean, you see a, a girl that wants to read engineering, and like, why? Why not? Hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that you, that sort of been labeled as a, a man's world mm -hmm. or a man's mm -hmm. uh, man's sector, a men's yeah. sector, you know. But yeah. of course not. So I think you know every 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 of those sectors have to be challenged. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, please, Dolapo, you want the, to say something? No, I'm leaving it open okay, for you. So, everyone uh, to so talk. I I I, I like, think um, I I agree with you. Um, you said it, it takes it takes the whole community or the whole village to raise a child. And for me, I, I want to look at it. I mean, from a business perspective, to say that um, so you have you have two girls and you have a boy, or you have three girls and two boys, and you give all the attention to the boys. That's two over five economic economic potential. So you, when you look at it, we are losing more money by not empowering them to live out their dreams, right? So we need to rewrite the narrative or rather create a new narrative. And the media 
um, industry will do, uh, go a long way to you know, pass on, circulate this narrative. One of the narratives I feel we need to um, drive a, lo a lot more is to say to the girl child that it is, it is what it is, mm -hmm. right? The world is cruel to every gender. It's not, so it, there's this thing that has been made, you know, that's where they came up with the whole glass ceiling, corporate mm -hmm. glass yeah. ceiling. No, 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 the ceiling is everywhere. Mm -hmm. That ceiling is affect, affecting the guy. But when the guy comes back home and says there's a ceiling, the father says, come on, go, go there, go break it. Yeah. That same thing should be told to the girl child. Go break that ceiling. Come yeah. on, go and read, do it again. Do that, that exam again. If we need to go and meet the person that is, that is bullying you, you we, we go and meet the person. So it has to be a deliberate, um, um, in, intentional, a, intentional um, from parents to say, you know, what do you tell the child? The girl child, when she comes back to say, I was bullied, I was done this, just tell the girl child. She doesn't have to lose her, um, her femininity or whatever it is because she wants to fight for her right. She can still keep it and still get through and do whatever she wants to do. She wants to fly, go ahead and fly. Nobody says you can't. Mm -hmm. And so the parents should encourage, the schools should encourage, but most importantly, the media should help drive this message because we are losing a lot, either as families, as societies, and as a nation mm -hmm. for that thing we are, we are not harnessing. Uh, totally, totally agree. However, we're still just talking about the young ones. Presently, current, what is, what is happening, right? Generally in the workplace, people aren't hired if they're a certain age or if they're married or because they're thinking about the time they're going to be mm -hmm. pregnant. How much, oh, that means I'll hire her. Next thing, she's going to have a baby. It's a problem. It's go, it's, so there also has to be a change in mindset of a working environment. What does it mean to work? And I don't feel that the decision to raise a family and still have a, a, some kind of career are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. However, things do have to give. So it's also, how do we create a culture to empower women to enter this space? And technology is a great space for women to yeah. enter. You know, what I'm working on, I, it was someone that told me that I'm a tech entrepreneur. I, I was like, what do you mean I'm a tech entrepreneur? Yeah, I'm terrible. I'm a yeah. Luddite. I was like, but what you're doing is technology. Yes, yeah. And I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's also switching our own yeah, mindset sure to understand that yeah. we want to, you know, women create businesses and enter businesses to fulfill a need. Mm. It's not necessary thinking the first step is like, I'm going to make money mm. or it's about money. The fact is you're doing it because you've seen a need. Mm -hmm. And women are, 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 are very reliable, they're dependable. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get them, welcome them into this space? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't like to talk about finances. We mm -hmm. don't like to really, you know, um, open up about those. Not because of anything to hide. It's just we've not been taught that. Mm -hmm. And it's important entering, entering this space that we speak up mm -hmm. and we demand a space at the table. So that means, yes, being able to pitch and present to people who have the capital, mm -hmm. but also to see people who look like us who are having the capital, who yeah. are on the boards, who are giving this funding as well. Mm -hmm. And that will help boost the technology environment and get women into the workplace. Because it's true, when women are included, mm -hmm. it is better all round for the society. Yeah. So it's very interesting what you just spoke about. So I'm going to take two points mm -hmm. from what you just spoke about. The first being the orientation. Mm -hmm. So I've met a lot of women and then when I told them what I do, and they're like, oh, you know, that, did you study computer science in school? Do you know how to code? And it's like, hmm, it's like what they are getting is that tech is all about coding, writing code, going to school to study computer science. But no, I study accounting. I do not know how to write, write one single code. And I'm still in the tech um, industry. So first of all, is the orientation. You do not need to know all this. This and so I think the jargons, the tech jargons that we push around in this part of the world is is what is one discouraging the um, girl child thinking oh it's too much I, I don't want to do that um, I don't want to study computer science I don't want to learn how to code so I think one is the orientation we all need to start reorientating the girl child that um, technology is not what like is peddled to be. Then two is about something has got to give. So I've been to accelerator programs <laughs> and the, um, my male counterparts, like when I told them my ambition, like what I want to do in this tech space, I want to be known in this 
take space. I want to carve a space for myself, a name for myself. And they tell me, if there's something has got to give, something's going to suffer. And, that, and that's your relationship. You probably won't find a man that will marry you because you're very ambitious on this thing that you want to do, uh, ambitious on this thing that you want to do. So you, your relationship might suffer. But you are doing the same thing I'm doing. You're a man, but nothing is given at your own end. You're not saying wife will not find you. Or you're, like, you're entering saucy but, territory here. I, I am. You're I, saucy. This is I a whole am, topic that, I am ah, going to, if I could get my teeth into this will, topic. Uh, no, like, what do you that, mean yeah. something's got, is, uh, something has got to give? Like, that thing doesn't make it. Because you're doing the same thing. So it's okay that you want to take over the tech industry in Nigeria <laughs> and whatever. And there's still a woman, because you're a man. So you feel a younger girl or this thing. You can get married at any time. But me, my time is going at 36. Who wants to marry me with all my tech distance? So I've, I've, I don't know. I think there's still, still this biasness. Absolutely. I won't say feminism. There's, there's bias. yeah, there's I don't absolutely know. Bias. I totally agree. Yeah. And I biases. think that one of the biggest biases is, is, the, is the emotion. They feel women are too emotional. But I always say that, you know, that's the strength more than it's a weakness. Unfortunately, a lot of women haven't even realized that, that mm -hmm. having emotion, I mean, think about it. Emotional intelligence is big now. Yeah. Everybody's talking about emotional intelligence. So you already have the emotion. Mm -hmm. The right thing is just to learn how to channel it properly. When you have a woman in your business, your mm -hmm. business does better. Mm -hmm. Because they understand emotion. They understand mm -hmm. empathy. They understand a lot of things that a lot of men don't understand. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that is, is, one, you know, is a weakness. I think it's a strength if it's properly channeled. But the, the old emotional thing, I feel like we are emotional beings, women. But I feel like the men try to like always point it out like, emotional and this thing like don't point it out i know what i am you don't need to point it out we can go on and on on this topic but up next is peter stay with us engaging millennials and the gen z's in the workplace how to harness their talents in building corporate nigeria all right so let me start by quoting a theory put forward as captured in a report called The Greatest Generation def um, Definition. Um, the American generations covered in the theory are um, greatest, we call one the greatest generation, born circa 1901 to 1924, um, silent generation circa 20, 1925 to 1945, baby boomers circa 1946 to 1964, generation X, circa 19, 1965 to 1985, and then Generation Y or Millennial Generation, circa 1985 to 2000. Please note that circa is a Latin word meaning about or around or approximately, so you can just replace that. Focus of my um, today's advocacy is on the Millennials and the Generation Z or Gen Z. According to an article published by the Journal of Applied Leadership and the Management, entitled Comparing Generation X and Generation Y on their preferred emotional leadership style. Generation Y, often referred to as millennials, nexus or next generation, um, happen to be the youngest generation in the current workforce before the influx of a new breed called Generation Z or Gen Z. I refer to another article titled Millennials versus Gen Z, Key Differences in the Workplace, and published by ADECO USA, and I quote, A member of Gen Z is anyone born between 1996 and the early-mid-2000s, um, 2000s, or um, and the end date can actually vary depending on the source. According to a report published by Kasasa on Gen X, Gen Y, and the Gen Z, Gen Z birth years span from 1997 to 2012, which is... Um, clearly after 1996. A flurry of potential labels and the nicknames have been um, appearing, including Gen Tech or Post Millennials, I Generation, Gen Wi Fi, Homeland Generation, and Zoomers. Now, Generation Z, therefore, are the post millennial generation. It is estimated that 50% of the current Nigerian workforce are millennials and even Gen Z in most tech firms. Now, the big thing is that managing them may become one of the most challenging tasks in today's workplaces. Older managers, many of whom are baby boomers who were born between 1946 and 1965, and Gen X, who were people born between 1965 or 66 to 1981 or 85, depending on the source. They perceive millennials as arrogant, insubordinate, impatient, too 
inquisitive, lazy, careless, and unorganized. Others believe they have an entitlement mentality. They hate to be coached or worst still, they hate to be bossed around. They have um, title, um, little or no regard for rules and policies, and are generally unsteady. Now, despite the above stated perception, millennials can be an asset rather than an liability. So the big question of national importance on the mind of most organizations should be, post-COVID-19, how can corporate Nigeria harness, harness the talents embedded in millennials and Gen Zs? I will address this from several touch points. Number one, culture. Culture, they, they say, it's strategy for breakfast. So if you do not get millennials and Gen Zs to buy into the corporate culture, then every strategy you have will fall flat. Culture needs to stop having mythical or esoteric feelings. The millennials must be able to associate with the prevalent um, culture and see how they can align with it as future leaders. The culture bandwidth must be extended to include collaboration, integration, experimentation, growth, openness, inclusion, diversity, teamwork, etc. Number two, leadership. In the absence of millennial role models, senior management must be intentional about embodying, uh, embodying setting critical values like innovation, flexibility, belongingness, um, empathy, job rotation, openness, and constructive feedback, including digital learning, humanity, inspiring trust, sense of accomplishment, adaptation to change, passion for learning, continuous engagement, respect for the individual, etc. Can corporate Nigeria come up with a realistic career building plan and leadership development plan um, that transform these set of workers into transformational, transgenerational leaders? The third point I have here is um, collaborative vision casting. Up until now, um, vision casting has been the exclusive preserve of top management. However, to prevent corporates from becoming dinosaurs, millennials must be involved in big picture thinking by making sure that they understand um, corporate culture, leadership, and the vision. I'm, going, I'm just going to, I'm take it. Go, uh, I'm going to take it right from where you... Let our millennials... millennials. Yeah, yes, let's start from our millennials. Um, the culture part is the one that got me. Yeah. Any culture that is outdated, we will replace with efficiency and um, effectiveness. We, we, do, we do not care because most of these organizations have outdated culture that is mm. not contributing anything to the KPIs we need to be tracking. Like mm. We don't care. Take it back home, take it, leave it in your family house. We do not care. Mm. And Gen Z's do not care. Exactly. They will not, not care. care. At <laughs> least millennials will still do it in a respectful way. Mm. And to this end, Gen Z will outrightly tell you, I don't care. So exactly. um, I feel like outdated cultures in workplaces need to go out. Bring, bring in more millennials, bring in Gen Z's, but they will holler with the Gen Z's because I was still having this conversation. This was your Gen Z's case. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting seeing a millennial <laughs> now being on Gen Z's <laughs> case. Because they will holler with those ones is that uh, they are very, very touchy mm. and they are very, very outspoken, yeah? Yes. They are very outspoken and very yeah. touchy. Yeah. A Gen Z will tell you, all right, I can't come to work today. I'm, I'm mentally down. Very yeah. international resilience. Like, yeah. I'm not, yeah. They, yeah. so very, they're very touchy. So I don't, I'm not going to be speaking much on them because, like, we've experienced Gen Z at our work. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, okay. I'm yeah, just, I know. I'll, I know. I'll stick to the millennials for now because, mm. oh, yeah. So, yeah. I just, yeah That's I mean, I sort of, like, a refreshing view to hear from like a millennial exactly. to the yeah. but i think you 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 really drew on some really interesting points so for me i get confused by all this gen next gen why gen, me i don't think like that now the person in front of me i can see yeah. uh -huh. so the thing is that with the younger ones i don't know what gen but they're younger than me Sha, yeah. always there has we have to train them in etiquette mm -hmm. always Mm -hmm. If you're running late, call that you're running late. Be mm -hmm. on time. Mm -hmm. Those basic things. How to write, mm -hmm. you know, an email. I mean, we don't write letter. Mm -hmm. How do you write an email? How do you mm -hmm. construct? So there's some really basic things that really we've had to teach every person in their 20s mm -hmm. that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. And that isn't their fault. That's an, of the fault of our educational system. Yeah. 
okay? Mm -hmm. But those are things that I notice in the, in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Now, please, we should, we should get rid of the old, old, old ways because yeah. let's, let's say what it is. Let's, this, our youth are not lazy. Mm -hmm. But if we have 40%, I think, unemployment in this country, who do you think it's hitting? Mm -hmm. What do you expect them to be doing? What jobs are available for them? Mm -hmm. So they're the ones going out, risking it all, starting new businesses, hustling, okay. doing all that because yeah. the country has not provided anything for them. So mm -hmm. me, I'm, a, I'm for the younger ones and I would never consider them lazy. Mm -hmm. What's unfortunate is, again, they're not really valued for the, for the input that they're putting. Because the, the, the president, God bless him, can wake up one morning and ban their source of income. Yeah. Self yeah. yeah. And yet, you want to say they're lazy, but yeah. they're hustling. They're doing, using the technology, the new technologies that are at hand to build a sustainable environment for themselves and their colleagues. Yeah. And in one strike, someone can wake up and decide it's not, yeah. it's not done. But you haven't put anything in place okay. for them. Yeah. So, f for me, I don't look at it as... There's something wrong with it. All of us have our issues. Every generation, whatever mm -hmm. generation you pick. Yeah. The issue is that, yes, we do have to teach them some certain cultures mm -hmm. that must continue. Mm -hmm. But we need to allow them the space to, to be able to eat. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Because we haven't put anything in place. They've been robbed. Yeah. They've been robbed, literally robbed of their future. Yeah. yeah. But yet they're still hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yet they're still trying. Mm -hmm. Yet they're still positive. Yeah. yeah. So we need to support, my, support them in any way we can. And of course, we have to let them know when they're, when they're yeah. not so doing they're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that it's been able to draw the critical balance. So on one hand, to be quite honest with you, I won't say let's flush out the old people mm -hmm. entirely mm -hmm. because there's some level of, ex there's no amount of money you can pay for experience. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, in some cases, <laughs> you know, we, we need that experience. Sure. We need some of that um, culture, like you said, that we need to pass mm -hmm. down. Some cultures are still relevant. They're mm -hmm. still useful. They're still valuable mm -hmm. in the workplace. You know, however, you know, this is a personal experience. Oh, I mean, I, have, I run a marketing firm and 90% of our staff are Gen Z. Mm -hmm. I have personally have to unlearn a lot of things mm -hmm. and relearn their language, relearn their culture. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, like they say, culture is strategy for breakfast. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite quotes, as a matter of fact. I'm so big on culture. because mm -hmm. But it starts from the, the company organization asking themselves the question, what is our vision? What do we want to achieve? Mm -hmm. I say to my clients, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not evolve. Mm -hmm. You know the story, you know the Blackberry story, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. They said, oh, you know, we did nothing wrong. No, you didn't do, the problem is you did nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When everybody was moving, you were not moving, you stayed where you were. Mm -hmm. So companies, organizations must learn how to evolve. And part of evolving is including the younger generation into your plan. So what you said about strategy, I mean, now this is where I everybody to talk. It will shock you what insight mm -hmm. a 14 year old, mm -hmm. an 18 year old would have on your overall strategy. Yeah. So you think you have this great strategy going forward, you're ready to go to markets. And then this 18 year old will just come and tell you, sir, what if you, you know, just tweak this thing and just yeah. changes everything. Yeah. So I think it's achieving the balance, you know, getting experience, you know, is important, but also getting the younger people with you know fresh ideas with fresh insights but also very important there's also training that is required mm -hmm. i know that how much you have to do in terms of something as simple as just send a text when you're running late mm -hmm. you know you can't deliver this on time just say in advance don't wait for me to ask you you know so there, there are things that you know and discipline is important as well you know we can't throw that away mm -hmm. you know well so, I, yeah. I i i thank you very much i i believe we are all i think the older generation whether it's baby boomers or gen <laughs> x they are like people hawking, still hawking the disc, the floppy disk, mm -hmm. or at best, the um, the what do you call it? Is the CDs? no 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 no. Yeah, maybe the CDs. Mm -hmm. But there's a generation that is hawking, you know, soft music. So mm -hmm. we need to come to that place where we synergize. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so going forward further, Tonya is pointing out a rising crisis, and um, we'll be back with Tonya after the break. School fees, a rising crisis. Yes, it's that time again, the beginning of a new school year and the mad dash to raise the money needed to pay school fees. 
Since the 1980s, there has been a terrible deterioration in the quality of education and general state of Nigeria's government-run schools. This drastic dis decline has led to a dramatic rise in private schools. So much so, it feels like there is a new one popping up on every street here in Lagos, which leads me to wonder perhaps that private schools are a lucrative business, in the same way that churches have sprung up on every street also. But that is another topic for another day. So what options do parents really have? One, send their children to a government school. This option is most likely when there is no other choice available due to finances or locale. Two, homeschool the children. Now this is becoming more of an attractive option since COVID. Many parents have woken up to the fact that with support, it is the best option, not only financially, but also in educating their child. This is, however, a hard option for working parents, as it is very hands-on and requires collaboration with tutors, virtual resources, and constant parental oversight. Three, private school, which is often the main option, as it fits in with working parents' schedules. However, it is far and above the most expensive option, for example, when your child starts at a new school, there is often a very large non-refundable deposit to be made for each child. Some schools, as much as one million naira per child. And you've not even paid tuition yet, too. How come schools can get away with this? Yes, deposits are made, but why are they non-refundable? Whilst I'm sure there is a regulating body for this, the fact that schools are able to operate this way means they are not actually being regulated in this instance. Standard procedure would be that with proper notice of your child leaving the school or graduating out, the deposit be returned. But no, not here in Nigeria. Another example, as per private schools, is the rising cost of school fees. Like myself, Many parents had a shocker when receiving the tuition bill with an increase of, say, 15%. Yet many schools feel it is their right to increase fees as they see fit. Now, I am in no way taking away from the fact that these past 18 months with COVID-19 and the mismanagement of Nigeria's finances by the federal government, leading to spiraling devaluation and skyrocketing inflation, have put many schools in crisis but it has also been the same for the most of us in the general population. I cannot accept the reason being given by schools for such a hike in fees being due to inflation. As 2020 to 2021, the rate of inflation has been around three to 4%, significantly lower than the rate of increase of many schools. So where is the value? We parents are told to accept it. That's the way it is. Otherwise, remove your child from the school. We as a society have now come to the point where the occurrence of parents working just to pay school fees is more and more common. Is this really sustainable? And how much longer can this continue? Right, so, so yeah, I think you've, you've touched a very sore point. Mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, <laughs> I won't lie to you. I, I don't, honestly, the last line for me is uh, should we just continue working to pay school fees and rents? Mm -hmm. Because they, this, those mm -hmm. two looks like the only th two things you are working on. I, on one side, I don't blame the school owners. The cost of doing almost everything is very high. Mm -hmm. So I would take it to the real people who are culpable, the government. Mm -hmm. You allowed government schools to fail completely mm -hmm. because most of you went to set up private schools and you needed a, 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 to make a case. You needed to frustrate parents. Government schools are not approachable again. So we are only, we are tied down with private schools. So for me, I think government needs to look into it to say, let's be realistic, fund schools, fund universities, fund secondary schools that you own. Or parents need to start working on Jackpot plan. <laughs> I don't know whether I should make that loud, but yeah. it's also an option. Yeah, mm. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's a very sore point. You know, I don't want to get started, you know. Get started. <laughs> I have a friend that said that, like you said, that the only two things that is in Lagos for is to pay rent and pay school fees. That's all. You know. But, however, you know, there are a few issues that I have a problem with, you know. Uh, you say it's not entirely the private owner's fault. I, I still leave some of the blame to them. 
you know, I'll tell you why. I have a pretty good idea what it takes to, I mean, I've started a few schools. I have a pretty good idea what it takes to run a school. I don't entirely agree that some of those monies they collect, you know, are directly commensurate to their cost of operations. Mm -hmm. I agree that the cost of operating anything in Nigeria is significantly higher than, you know, most places in the world. However, they're not exactly commensurate. I mean, I have a few friends that work in the bank, and if you hear what they pay in terms of interest on the loans for schools, mm -hmm. it's way higher than other people. Mm -hmm. But that's because the banks also know that they make a killing in terms of profits. Mm -hmm. That's why they can set those interest rates. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And they will accept those interest rates also, knowing that they are going in Money for... Do you see what I'm saying? So, so there's, a, there's a big problem there that needs to be checked, right? Now, that's a root problem. The root problem is the government, what you mentioned, the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, at public schools... I mean, I went to public secondary school, and it was quite fine. Do you know what I'm saying? The primary was, okay, because... You know, we just wanted to go to a private, but probably I went to public. And what happened to all the model schools? What happened to all the federal government colleges? Mm -hmm. What happened to all those, the commands, you know, the Navy schools? What happened to all of those schools? Those were good schools. I went to a command. Mm -hmm. Those were very good schools. Mm -hmm. You learn training, you learn, you know, education, academics, Discipline. everything. So that's the first part of it. So uh, part of the problem is also those entrepreneurs. Those have decided to make education, you know, a, a business, business for profit. You know, too, I mean, too much profit. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay to make profit. Because, I mean, when we were growing up, they said the teacher's reward is in heaven. Hmm. Not any longer. <laughs> Partly, the reward now is in part of the school owner. Because teachers, they don't get paid that well. Yeah. Thank Anyways. you. I was about to say, yeah. teachers oh, don't get no, reward. Trust please, me, I know that as well. So sometimes, you go to those schools, you know, big schools, they're charging millions of naira. But if you hear what they pay their teachers, mm -hmm. during the lockdown, I mean, the I mean, personal experience, the lesson she got from my daughter, after the lockdown, she didn't go back to her school. Because the money she was making from mm -hmm. just having three, four parents, that were paying her a salary just to teach their mm -hmm. children at home. She didn't go back to school. Which is why I put in that other option, right? Yeah. So for one year <laughs> during th this past year, um, mm -hmm. this past in, for one year of that, I homeschooled my own children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I and my nanny, I trained her, we homeschooled, we set curriculum, we did everything. So I really got a hands-on experience of what it meant to educate a child. And to be honest, that is looking more and more like the best option for a lot. If parents are able to, to handle it. Mm. But there's so much demands on us in, 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 in daily life. You have to make money. So, so you have to make money. And these days, both parents need to be out in the workforce mm -hmm. or in the workforce. One may not be out, one may be like me at mm. home in the workforce, yeah. um, but working. And so it's finding um, that balance. The, 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 the thing is that it's getting to the point where it's going to be cheaper for us to send our children abroad to school. Uh, and it. that is what really blows my mind, is yes. that, yeah. wait, it's, 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 it's almost there. We're almost yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So what does that mean for do, our system? Do, do you yeah. know this point you just made? A friend of mine calculated what he needed to send her, um, his daughter through secondary school. Yeah. Abroad? Um, no, in Nigeria. in Nigeria. What they needed to relocate mm. was about $9 million. What he needed to send this girl to secondary school was about 12 million. Mm -hmm. Think about it. it they makes absolutely are no sense. waiting for their last paper mm -hmm. to relocate. That's secondary school. Let's not talk about the university. No, university. Yeah. Private university. university. Yeah. I'm talking about secondary That's school. That's ridiculous. I mean, Private universities don't need to touch that. So why, why mm -hmm. should you stay here mm -hmm. and go through that? Yeah. Don't, not, don't yeah. give up. Uh, no, I'm not giving up. <laughs> and for me, I'm going to like play, um, play the advocate. fifth. In this um, matter, because like I'm not no, that's totally involved fine. to yeah, do, we'll, do, we'll do, wait do for again. you to get there. Yeah, <laughs> but the thing I'm learning though from like you guys and then the people before us is that um, I'm cautious about like how many children I want to have because I want them to have the best life, mm -hmm. the best education, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I think that's what Baby Bloom has been put into consideration mm -hmm. about like family planning and mm -hmm. things like that. Because yeah. now, if you'd ask me if I get married tomorrow, I want to have one child. If if I go above and beyond, they are going to be just two. Even, the, even these days, one self is one plenty. or maximum two, and that's because I do not want to work just to keep um, mm -hmm. paying school fees and paying rent. I want to work, give my child the best life and still enjoy mm -hmm. exactly. my freedom and my life and my investment. So it's kind of like um, with millennials and with Gen Z, it's like now we've seen how it is mm -hmm. affecting you guys. Mm -hmm. We won't make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. We are going to plan because we do not want to work for rent and for school fees. We mm -hmm. want to work for um, future rest and relaxation. And I, and I think also this is um, where technology comes in, 
as well. Mm -hmm. And the younger generation comes, comes in is that technology and these teachers who want to teach, who are passionate about the jobs they need, teachers, technology, and children Students, and parents. Yeah. And at some point, we're going to have to cut out the schools. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, boycott yes. The school. Hashtag boycott the school. Boycott the school. Hashtag, 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 hashtag oh, breaking school. Break school. Break school. I like that. <laughs> so, what a wonderful topic. It was mine, of course. Join us again next week on another edition of The Advocate. The advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook. Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. G. To catch up with the previous broadcast, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Join us next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society.